Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for Coaching from the Inside Out, How Understanding Motivation Benefits Coach and Coachee. We're so excited to have you here. Uh, we know schedules are really busy, and so really appreciate you taking the time to learn with us a little bit today. So my name is Lucy. I'm going to be your host today, along with my colleague, Kayla Burnett. And before we begin, I'm going to get us off to just a quick start with some housekeeping. Uh, we are recording today's webinar, as you might have heard when you signed on. So you'll get a link to that recording. You'll get the slides. Um, we do a blog post that kind of wraps up all the key points. We have some great bonus materials, Q&A. You'll get all of that afterwards. So no worries about that. Uh, to stay focused during the webinar, we do have the chat closed and cameras will mostly be off. Um, but we absolutely want to hear from you. We want your questions. We want your comments, all of that stuff throughout. So as questions occur to you, just pop them in that Q&A box that we're all pretty used to now on Zoom. Um, so any questions you have, we have a couple good Q&A breaks here. So we'll get to a lot of them right during the broadcast, but any that we don't, we'll make sure we follow up with you afterwards. And those will also appear in our Q&A um, that goes out to everybody afterwards. And a lot of times we have some really stimulating discussion even after the webinar. So please, anything you have questions about, um, go ahead and throw that in there anytime. You don't have to wait for the breaks. Uh, and I'm going to give you just a brief introduction of who MRG is, um, if this is one of your first times with us. Um, so we're a global leader in designing assessments um, that impact people in profound and meaningful ways. So we have assessments for leadership, motivation, which you'll be hearing about today, personal development, sales, uh, a lot of different products. And we've been supporting coaches with assessments for over 40 years. This is actually our 40th year here at MRG. So we've been in this field a long time through a lot of different eras. Uh, we work closely with coaches. We do coaching ourselves, program development, leadership development, all those things. So um, all over the, the industry and the space. Uh, the assessments are driven by research and they're just designed to foster self-awareness for lasting growth. So it's really about that um, that deep self-insight. Uh, the assessments have been used by thousands of coaches. They're available in about 20 languages around the world um, in over 100 countries. So um, we have a lot of great, great data that comes from that. And our presenter today is Drew, Andrew or Drew Rand. Uh, so Drew is an IO psychologist. He's based here in our Portland, Maine office. Uh, Drew has a big breadth of experience in consulting and developing leadership programs. He coaches, he works with leaders and coaches leaders around the world. And uh, Drew just has an endless curiosity for assessments. He, he plays a very important role here in designing and developing and refining the assessments and our programs and, um, and just um, really being on the ground as a coach um, and getting a lot of that experience for us and bringing it here to MRG. So with that, I will hand things over to Drew. Thank you, Lucy. I appreciate it. Um, I'm glad that part's over, the most awkward part of the webinar for me. Um, <laughs> so uh, pleasure to be with you all um, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. Um, if you uh, know me or know MRG, uh, good to see you. Thank you uh, for coming. And if you are new, uh, looking forward to uh, introducing myself and MRG and uh, kind of what we hold near and dear here uh, over the next 45, 60 minutes. What are we going to be talking about today? Um, very simply coaching, right? Um, and I think motivation in coaching. Uh, I feel lucky that uh, coaching is, is part of my career. Um, for those of you who uh, you do it, I think you probably feel the same. It is a uh, it's a it's a wonderful career for a variety of reasons. Get to meet a lot of people, hear a lot of stories, uh, share a lot of perspectives. Um, uh, and yes, it's a it's a it's a great career. Um, and and we're going to be talking about it today. So what are we going to be covering? Where does it begin, right? Where does coaching begin? I think one of the more challenging aspects of coaching is, is how to start. Um, then we're going to jump into motivation, why it matters, um, how it's important at work, um, how do we measure it? Um, and then we're going to jump into some case studies, uh, just very quick case studies to talk about the practical applications of motivation and how we use it. I'll probably intertwine um, some of my own stories and practicality throughout, but uh, the case studies will really make it concrete. And then we'll wrap up with, uh, with where to go from here. So before we get into the content, though, um, let's do a quick poll. I'm just curious why uh, why everyone is here, right? So why are you interested in learning about motivation? Um, so you get a few choices there. Choose all that apply, uh, and we'll just give you a few few seconds to uh, to complete this. It's always interesting and fun to find out what brings yeah. folks here. For and sure. of course, we did let people choose everything. And I feel like I feel like knowing coaches, it's like all of it, all of it. Oh. I want it all. <laughs> so we'll see how the responses come out. Thanks so much, everybody. I'll give it just another second. And 
let's share those results. Okay, sorry, it's on my other screen here over here. So um, good, individual coaching, 81% of you, lovely. Uh, we're going to be talking about our, um, uh, one of the case studies today and right out of the bat. Uh, but boy, um, a lot of people here just own development um, and just learn, love learning new things. So good. Um, uh, a nice uh, cadre of, of responses there. Uh, so that's excellent. Okay, so uh, I'm going to turn off camera here so I don't distract myself too much as we get into uh, content uh, and we are off and away. So as a coach, um, where do you begin? Uh, and what I mean by that is um, how do you start to understand and learn the individual that you will be working with, right, over uh, over a period of time. You know, these relationships usually uh, become pretty deep over, uh, over a period of time, uh, but where do you start, right? And I think some classic ways of going about it um, first might be interviews and observations, right? Maybe you are talking to individuals that the person works with, key stakeholders. Maybe you're even going into, uh, into the workplace and observing the individual uh, and, you know, how they, a day in the life, right? You see them in meetings, so on and so forth. Um, I know it doesn't happen potentially quite as much as it used to, but it can be a, a really powerful uh, way of getting to know the individual that you are working with. Maybe assessments, right? 360 assessments that really talk about um, individuals' behavior, leadership behavior, um, maybe their skill or ability, um, really trying to get an understanding of how is this person experienced on a, on a day in and a day out basis, and maybe even a step further, what's the distinction between how they perceive themselves at work versus, again, how they're being perceived by others can be really powerful and very, um, I think, important toward um uh, toward concrete uh, paths for development can be really helpful there. Maybe personality, right? Uh, assessments that talk about uh, a person's, uh, you know, characteristics or traits that may be a little bit more stable over time, uh, that might have some implications for their behaviors or decisions. Uh, personality is absolutely something that can be valuable, I think, in the in the coach coaching process, especially at the beginning, trying to get an understanding of, of who the individual is. Maybe just instinct, right? I know I've, I've got a few um, close coach friends who uh, just say, "Ah, just let me meet him. Let me talk to him. I'll I'll figure it out." Uh, and uh, by and large, they're great at it, right? So I think uh, you know, I think coaches. We, we got into this uh, profession for a reason, uh, and I think coach instinct is uh, is one of them uh, for sure. But in all of this, uh, you know, what's missing here? You know, what's missing with with what's on um, on the screen? And I think what's important to recognize is that what's on the screen here in interviews, observations, personality, 360 assessments, they give us the what or the how, right? They kind of, they give us the what's happening or how is it happening? Um, and in all of that, you know, you can observe, uh, you can observe behavior, you can observe skill, um, you know, interviews and, and people will talk about what it is they observe in, in the individual and how they experience them. Um, even personality degree, I mean, I guess we probably get into it in, into a debate about it. Uh, we don't have enough time today, but I think personality really talks more about the what um, th than anything else. Um, and so these are all things that you uh, you can observe. And I think even your coach instinct, right, is uh, is an observational technique. But for me, what's important in what it is that we do as coaches is that I think sustainable change really starts with clarity on the why, which for me is a step before the what or the how. Why is the thing happening in the first place? Without the why, it sort of feels like uh, we're just putting kind of a Band-Aid on the situation and sustainable change, actually changing a habit, habit changing a pattern, uh, that starts with, I think, the why. Um, and so why does, uh, you know, why do I engage in the, this behavior? Why do I make the decision I make, um, even if it's not the best one? Why do I have the reaction I have? Why do I have the expectations I have? Um, why do I feel the way that I feel? Those questions for me that start with the why are really um, uh not only what makes our profession as coaches very interesting, uh, but also what makes us really valuable for uh, the people that we work with. So what is when I say the why, what, what do I mean? Well, um, I mean motivation, right? I, I mean motivation to put a word on it. 
And, um, and so motivation uh, for me really talks about the, uh, the why uh, somebody does what it is that they do and a whole host of other things that we'll get into. Now, it's not a silver bullet. Um, uh, I wish it was. I wish there was a silver bullet in coaching. And if I had one, I don't, I don't know that I'd give it to you. Uh, but uh, the, um, you know, motivation isn't one, but it absolutely can create a clarifying awareness, right? Um, you know, it can, it can lead to that helpful, um, helpful answer of the why. And I think what's important to recognize about motivation is that People can't always name it um, or even observe it, uh, but it, it it absolutely influences everything uh, that they do. I mean, it influences everything I do, influences everything uh, you do, and I think having an understanding about what it is is really important um, in this process. And I'm going to come back to again, you know, the, this this aspect of it not being observable because that's a really important point in why I think uh, motivation is really um, really critical. Okay. What is it? Why does it matter? Uh, so the simple definition here with motivation is what drives you or attracts you, what drains you or repels you, right? Um, which I think is, a, is an, a definition that most people will understand. When I am working with individuals, um, I usually I usually give something along this these lines, but then I say, you know, if I go a little bit deeper than that, uh, what I am talking about is really emotional satisfaction and emotional energy. Right. What types of situations, envi environments, decisions, behaviors are you attracted to? Do you like? Do you feel comfortable in? Uh, does gravity pull you toward? Uh, do you and you know you enjoy being in that space uh, versus the opposite of that? Right. I don't. I don't like making that decision. I don't like that environment. I don't like that situation. I don't like relationships that look like that. See so you. Uh, you know, gravity is pushing you the opposite direction, and you don't make decisions that would put you there, right? Even if it's good for you, right? Hint, hint. Uh, you know, you don't you don't end up in the place uh, because that's something that is, is uncomfortable in some way, shape or form. And again, it's not what you see on the outside, right? Um, motivation is not observable. It absolutely is, is internal uh, for individuals. What is it that they, they value it at some level? Um, and so let's dig a little bit deeper into what motivation is and, and what it isn't. And I think one of the easiest ways to do that is just do the comparison between behavior and motivation, because it is a it's a critical distinction. And I think um, even more so than that, you know, you know, as well as I do, that the correlation between motivation and behavior is not is not one to one. And that's, I think, important to hold on to just because you are motivated to do something does not um, mean that you end up doing it. So um, let's dig a little deep here. So behavior an action habit pattern um, or an activity that you engage in, right? It's something that you're you're doing day in and day out. Motivation, on the other hand, is something within um, that drives you, excites you, energizes you. Um, and it's, uh, again, it's sort of internal to the, to the individual. People around you can observe behavior, right? You, people can observe um, what you do, uh, they can observe the decisions you make, um, uh, and uh, and you can, you know I can observe your behavior. You can observe you can observe mine. Motivation, on the other hand, uh, again, people cannot observe uh, motivation. I can't observe yours. You can't observe mine. And again, this goes back to this comment about the correlation between motivation uh, and behavior is not one to one, which is really critical. We'll talk more about it in a second, um, and it leads to a, a few other factors that are are very important in relation to motivation. Your behavior may reflect your environment or a specific situation, right? Behavior uh, can change or alter depending on where you are, what you think the world needs from you. What does this person want from me? Uh, you know, what type of behavior is required right here, right now? Motivation, on the other hand, is intrinsic, and it often stays consistent when their circumstances change. So, um, yes, sometimes you're motivated to go left, and you do go left. Sometimes you're motivated to go left, but you go right, which is, you know, the behavior is the right. So, um, you know, just because the, the situation might be different, the behavior might be different, but the motivation doesn't change, right? It stays consistent, um, remarkably consistent, even when the circumstances change. Behavior, you have behavioral patterns that develop over time, um, but behaviors, again, they might differ from day to day. Motivation, on the other hand, um, you know, you have motivations 
that are again remarkably consistent, right? They uh, motivations that develop earlier in your um, in your life, um, and they stay consistent a- across. Um, uh, across the duration of, of your lifespan. Whereas, yeah, you might have behavioral patterns that um, that develop over time that you, you might show the same uh, behavior uh, on, a, on a regular basis, um, probably because of a, a particular motivation. But uh, again, your behavior can really differ from day to day, whereas motivation does not. So distinction between motivation and behavior, I think is helpful also um, what does motivation sound like, right? So um, when people start talking uh, about motivation, what does it sound like? Well, let's give a few examples. Um, so when I start when I, when I start something, I feel like I have to see it through. I can't walk away from a project that's half finished. This might be talking about a motivation to be really persistent or strong-willed or, you know, once something is on my plate, it is not moving off my plate until it is until it is done. Right. And it's this motivation to stick with it and actually sticking with it feels good. Right. I don't need another hook to stay engaged. Um, uh, the, the hook for me is um, is I is I enjoy staying per- persistent and that provides a level of satisfaction in and of itself. Um, I wish I had a little bit more of this motivation, but I, I can get a little distracted at times. Um, I feel uneasy when I don't understand exactly what uh, what the rules are in a given situation. So this might be a motivation to um, understand understand the boundaries, right? What's what's right and wrong um, here at the, you know in this situation or at this organization? What's expected? Um, and I really I need to know that because I want to stay because uh, I'm a rule follower, right? I, I value I value rules um, and the the black and whiteness and the right and wrong of it uh, makes me feel very comfortable, provides us satisfaction. So I want to I want to know what those rules are. I feel like I come alive when I'm in front of a crowd. Um, you know, this might be a motivation to to draw attention to oneself, right? Enjoy having eyes on you. It doesn't mean necessarily all the time, but you know, when I'm on stage, um, that is satisfying for me. I value that quite a bit, uh, and enjoying that that positive attention in some way. Oh, I hate asking other people for help. I always rather tough it out and do it on my own. This might be motivation to be self sufficient. Right, be self reliant. Um, having the the comfort and the satisfaction, knowing that you don't have to depend on anyone else, and that, that you can you can get it done um, on your own, um, and feeling you know absolutely comfortable and okay in in sort of isolated settings, I think is uh, is maybe an offshoot of the motivation to be self reliant or or, um, or not dependent. Competition brings out something in me, even if it's just a board game. I love to win. Right, so here's a here's a motivation um, to be competitive, <laughs> whether or not the situation is a competitive one. You know, people who are who are, who are motivated by sort of the win lose, they see the world through the through the lens of win lose. Um, I'll talk about the seeing the world through the lens of a little bit more here in a second. But um, being motivated to compete, right? There are there are winners and there are losers, and you know which one I'm going to be. Um, and so that's maybe uh, what that might sound like for folks. So I think what's important here is that, um, you know, some people can recognize or even articulate a few of these things and things on their own. I think people can talk about what it is that they value at some level. I think um, uh, and, you know, motivation, I I think, speaks about values at some level. Right. This is this is what I value. This is what I feel comfortable in. This is what I enjoy. People often can articulate that. But I think comprehensive self-awareness of uh, of an entire motivational you know profile or set is next to impossible. And then I think even more importantly, uh, and I'll talk more about this in a second. But um, knowing how much you have of a motivation in comparison to others is impossible because of what I was saying earlier about um, motivation not being observable, right? Is, uh, which I think is a really important aspect here. Okay. For me, four key things to really understand uh, about motivation. First things first, uh, motivational factors originate from our formative years and evolve uh, slowly over time. So, uh, yes, you know, the first 10, 12, 15 years uh, of an individual's life, uh, depending on a, a myriad of factors, nature, nurture, motivational uh, dimensions and factors, uh, they start to originate um, in those early years. And yes, they they slowly evolve over time. People are always very curious when I'm working with them, does this stuff change? 
absolutely it changes, right? What I tell people is, you know, what you have in front of you is your um, a culmination of your life experience, right? Um, and if you were to learn about your motivations five years ago, they probably you'd have five years less experience. And if you were to learn about it five years from now, you'd have five years more. And that would probably color, uh, color it a little bit. Uh, but uh, that being said, there are some motivations, and this is what I tell people, uh, is there are some motivations where, you know, you were this way when you were 11, you were this way when you're 25, you're this way now, and you're going to be this way when you were 70. Uh, and, um, and so there's just these, th some of these things are very core to, uh, to individuals uh, that is um, important to recognize. And again, while we might recognize our behavior quite easily, some people are uh, less in touch with what these deeper underlying drivers are. Or again, going back to what I just said, mentioned a second ago, not understanding um, uh, just how much or how little they have of them. So my, most people will be surprised by how strong or weak uh, some of their motivations are compared to others, because again, You've never been able to compare yourself to others before, right? I always tell people, you know, behavior, you you can compare yourself to people. You've been doing it forever. You do it every day. You walk into a room and someone's yelling and you say, boy, I'm not as angry as that person is, right? There's your, there's your barometer. There's your measuring stick. Motivation, not able to do that. And so because of that, um, it's truly difficult to have a really objective view of yourself because you've never been able to actually understand where you sit um, in comparison to others. And so because of this, people might ex um, with extreme motivations are very likely um, to underestimate this extremity. We are now getting into the good stuff about what motivation is and why it is um, so critical and so helpful in coaching. So yes, while people might directionally um, understand what it is that pushes them forward or repels them in some way, shape, or form. Because they've never been able to observe it um, uh, or compare themselves against anybody else, um, they don't understand uh, uh, or don't have, again, a, a barometer of where they would sit on this scale. And so um, what happens over time is we tend to normalize our own motivational profile, right? Let's just go back to the, the, the competitive in this example. Somebody might know that they were know that they're competitive, right? I know that. Um, but they might not know that they are, you know, a lunatic about it, right? You know, if you are in the, maybe you're in the 95th or 99th percentile of how competitive, um, and it's likely that they have underestimated, underestimated that extremity and instead told themselves a story of, doesn't everybody feel like this? Doesn't everybody see the world through this lens, through this experience? Because um, they're the only person who have lived uh, in their in their skin for as long as they've done that. And then finally, motivation can conflict with itself. Um, so this is something that I work with people all the time, where um, you know motivations do not always line up, right? Yes, they can, right? Motivations can line up where and it creates a um, sort of a reinforcing pattern in some way. But in other instances, uh, you have motivations that are that are pushing and pulling you, right? You know, you have mixed feelings and because one driver is, you know, one motivation or driver is pushing you one way or another motivation driver is pushing you another one. And it's like, ah, which one do I pay attention to? Which one wins um, at, at some level? Um, and they often interfere with one another, which um, can cause friction for people for sure. So why should we um, be exploring motivation at work? Um, so uh, first things first, um, I think, yes, motivation is helpful at work. I think motivation is helpful in general, right? Uh, just in day-to-day -day life. Um, and, uh, and so I think it's helpful, uh, helpful everywhere. But I think the really important thing is here is motivation helps um, answer some really critical work-related questions. Why do I think the way that I think? Um, why do I make the decisions that I make? Um, why do I behave the way I, the way I behave? Why do I feel the way that I feel? And what I always tell people when I'm working with them um, in the motivational space is, you know, your motivation has implications for a wide variety of, of things in your life. And these are four of my favorite, right? Well, you know, why do I always think like this? Why do I make this decision? And why do I always end up with this behavior? Um, why do I feel the way that I feel? I love that. I love that question. So um, what does most motivation do for the coach, 
so this is uh, another great thing. Yes, the, the individuals you'll be working with, um, they, you might use an assessment to uh, to find out what their motivational profile is, um, and that's helpful for them. But also, how does it help you as a coach? First things first, it helps build rapport um, because it will uh, give you some insight into an individual before you've even met them. Uh, and that can be really helpful in the in the building rapport aspect make you seem smarter, right? Uh, again, the uh, using uh, using motivational assessments can be really helpful uh, in terms of almost having um, having the story before the, before the person even shares it in some way. Um, and it will make you seem kind of more intelligent like you're like you're a wizard at some level. Get faster buy-in. For me, this is really important because it makes you seem like you know what you're talking about. I was working with a guy six months ago who'd worked with coaches in the past. Motivation had not been a, a part of any of the things that he had done. And by the third session, you know, he was he was calling me. He was he was calling me. Oh, you're my guy, um, because again, I think the buy-in uh, was really helpful in terms of me being able to understand him. Um, and it's not because I'm you know uh, extra amazing uh, coach. I think it absolutely is because we were using motivation. Get clarity on what your coachy values. So now this is um, this is really uh, important. You get a very clear understanding of what they value. Again, what's moving them forward, and um, uh, and I think what's really critical here is it gives you insight that they not might not be able to actually articulate to you, which is really important. It'll also help you hear their internal narrative, right? So we all have we all have an internal narrative about what's going on, what's expected, what just happened, what's going to happen. You know, there's a story, um, and uh, and that internal narrative, uh, you know, that person on your shoulder very often is the motivational profile. And so, if you know that um, as a coach. Uh, if you know your coachee's internal narrative, you can respond to it um, with, again, a little bit more intelligence, a little bit more objectivity. Uh, and if you if you know that story, you can um, you can you can challenge your your coachee in in different ways. I think is the best way of of, of saying it. And I love having their understanding their motivational profile because it. Um, uh, I can hear their stories. I can hear their narrative through the lens of their motivational profile. And it allows me to, um, I think, call them out where appropriate. Are you overdoing this? Or are you underdoing that? Um, and very helpful. Build a foundation for your work. Very simply here. Yes, it starts at the beginning. But even if I'm in a six-month coaching engagement, I'm still talking about motivation at the five-and-a-half-month mark. Right. So it's something that I continually return to, can continually helpful um, and is used throughout the in engagement for me. And again, allows you to hear and respond to them with more specificity throughout the engagement. So without being too redundant, it's really just what I was just talking about, being able to hear that, hear their narrative, hear their stories through that lens of their motivational profile, which is just very helpful um, for you uh, as a coach. All right. What does it do for the coachee? Right absolutely increases self-awareness. Everything that I've been describing, um, I think it is uh, very uh, helpful there in terms of building our own self-awareness. I think recognizing potential biases. Where do you um, where do you see the world through a lens that not a lot of other people see it through, right? Uh, which is, is very helpful um, in that space. Helping, uh, can helpful, eh, excuse me, uh, can help challenge their internal narrative, right? What is the story that they're telling themselves and how can we, um, where might you be lying, you know, where might they be lying to themselves is a, is a phrase that I often use. And, and understanding their motivations will be helpful in understanding where they might be going off the rails there a little bit. Learn where to be more intentional with their decisions, reactions, and behaviors. Um, what do you, uh, what I tell people is what do you need to keep in your consciousness? Uh, where if you didn't have an understanding about why you were pushed that way or why you're pulled that way, the decision is always going to be this. But because you understand it now, what do you need to what do you need to be more intentional about? What do you need to hold in the consciousness to to make a decision or a behavior, um, or maybe even try and change a reaction uh, in some way uh, to help you not end up where you always end up? And and lastly, understand how they're weird. Um, and I do, I use this term, uh, understand how they, how individuals are weird. And this really, again, talks about where do you see a world 
Um, where do you have expectations? Where do you have uh, have reactions where you are unique? You are unique because not a lot of other people have this motivation to the extent that you have it or don't have it. Uh, and that can be very, uh, people love this language and people react to this and respond to this. And it's very, very helpful for them to understand like, oh, if you put me in a room with 10 people, I might be the only one who sees it through that, through that lens. Common assumption um, is that people want, need, or value all the same things. How different can motivations be? You know, oh, people love to collaborate. Uh, everyone just wants recognition. Uh, no one's satisfied at, at staying at the same level. Um, and I think there is an assumption that like everybody wants these things. And it's just not true. Um, not everyone likes to collaborate, right? Some people like their own space. Not everyone wants to be um, given recognition. Um, some people are fine staying where, where they are. Um, and so, uh, you know, how does, how different can they be? And very simply, I'm putting this, uh, the correlational table up here of a, of a motivational assessment, the IDI, which we'll talk about here a little bit more. Um, yes, it's a little, it's a little nerdy, but the point I'm trying to make here is, um, as you can see, there are not a lot of, um, uh, highly correlated motivations here. Um, and, and meaning people are unique, people are different. And, um, you know, they're not correlated with another. So just because you value one thing doesn't necessarily mean you value another. Um, they're also not correlated with effectiveness, right? There's no perfect profile. People ask me all the time, like, is it, is it a good profile? Can I be a leader? Yeah, yes, you absolutely can be a leader. Um, I can talk to you about what aspects of it you will enjoy and what aspects you won't. Uh, but, you know, I'm not, we're not talking about um, effectiveness here. And they're not, motivations are not universal, right? There's not a common motivational profile. Each individual is unique. And I think, you know, the, the shaded correlational table here in the background is, is what is showing you that. Okay, um, I've been talking here uh, for 20, 25 minutes. Um, Lucy, any questions come in? Anything else I can answer? Um, yeah, just a couple. And I do want to let you move on because we can, we'll get yeah. to questions again at the end. Um, but so do you... Um, think that client motivations can surface through like values exploration is that a place where you would get to some of that stuff yeah i think there's i think there is some similarity between um motivation and, and value the uh without going too far I, there is a distinction for me i think values um can take a little bit of a left-hand turn and and lead to a different conversation um but there for me there is some similarity between uh between motivation and values the what I like to say here, though, is that I like looking at motivation almost separate from it, because for me, it generates um, a different uh, a different conversation. And uh, the different conversation is it doesn't come with any preconceived uh, notions, which uh, for me is it usually doesn't uh, is very helpful. Thanks. Um, yeah. All right. In the interest of time, um, I'm going to go to Jody's question, which is a great segue to our next section. So thank you, Jody. What are the best ways to approach conversations about motivation and are there categories or structure to provide? I feel like that leads us very Perfect. nicely into the next half of the yeah. webinar. So thank you, everyone. And do keep them coming. Like I said, even though we didn't get to a lot this time, we'll get to more at the end and we'll get to you afterwards. So please don't hesitate to drop those questions, discussion items, ideas right into the Q&A. We appreciate them. All right. So I will answer Jody's question here um, as we uh, move into the, the second half of the uh, webinar uh, for today. So measuring motivation, how do we uncover the unobservable? Well, um, I, I've sort of mentioned it here um, and uh, the IDI is a, an assessment, uh, individual directions inventory, excuse me, IDI for short, is motivational profile uh, or motivational assessment that we uh, have here at MRG. Um, and it is a, uh, a semi-ipsative uh, psychometric questionnaire that measures 17 motivational dimensions. I wish I had enough time to talk to you about um, every single uh, dimension here, um, uh, but these are the 17. As you can see, they are put into six different clusters. Um, the clusters, uh, meaning that the dimensions uh, or the motivations within each all have something in common. Um, and, uh, and this is the, uh, this is the, when I'm talking about motivation, this is the assessment that I'm referring to and what I use and, and hold near and dear to my heart. Um, I think the, one thing I'll say here is, uh, 
there is so much value in the fact that we just the, the, about the specificity here of, of the IDI that we break it down into 17 dimensions. The specificity in and of itself um, is really valuable. Semi ipsative, um, what does that mean? Oh, I'll say, uh, so it's a semi ipsative psychometric questionnaire, and uh, it's the same design that we use for all of our MRG assessments. It's unique in some ways, maybe um, not something that uh, many of you have heard of or, or seen in other assessments. What does it do for us? Well, um, so you have your STEM, you have your three choices here, um, and we are asking somebody to choose the one that is most like them, right? So A, B, or C, uh, what is most like me? And this individual has chosen A. And then within that decision, they have to choose how well that, um, uh, you know, draw on others represents them. Does it represent me really well? Yes, it's a five. Does it represent me less well? Um, it's a four. And then once they've chosen of the three, the one that feels uh, that represents them the best, they have to now uh, choose the next one. Uh, this individual has chosen B and they also, and they feel as if uh, this one doesn't represent them quite as well. So they've chosen a two. So what does the semi ipsative design allow us to do? Well, it allows us to capture order because individuals are, uh, are, are rank, rank ordering here, but also it allows us to capture magnitude, which is really the brilliance of the semi ipsative um, design. If you're just capturing order, you don't know, you know whether or not the, the, uh, the difference between uh, the rank ordering for one person might be a lot smaller than it is the next. And so capturing the, the, um, the magnitude of that, of that rank ordering is really important and allows us to uh, discern within individuals really well. Okay, motivation. How do we identify it? Well, um, individual directions inventory, the IDI is uh, the uh, assessments for that. And how do we use it? Uh, you can use it a, a million different ways. These are some of these are just up on the screen. Um, I can't think of an instance where I wouldn't want to know uh, someone's motivational profile or where it wouldn't be helpful. Um, this is also the assessment that I that I give to people when they ask me, Drew, what do you what do you do for a living? Um, and I, I'll give them the IDI and we'll we'll talk about it and I'll say that's sort of what I do for a living, and uh, it's just a, a a great assessment in that space. So the uh, two case studies we're going to do. Uh, we're going to talk about briefly. I'm going to talk about individual development, and then I'm going to talk about team dynamics. And within each of those, I'm going to talk about a specific theme, um, because I think themes, again, are a really helpful way to think about how do we apply motivation practically? Uh, you know, how do I help somebody understand this thing more specifically versus just kind of a 30,000 foot view, excuse me. Interpersonal sensitivities is the one we're going to use for individual development and information or informational needs is what we're going to use for team dynamics. Um, please be aware that these are just two themes. There are a lot of themes uh, that you can think about or talk about when it comes to the IDI. These are just two of my favorite that I find um, really valuable and really helpful. So let's talk about a case study here briefly. So using coaching, using motivation and coaching to identify interpersonal sensitivities. Um, so what do I mean by interpersonal sensitivities? Well, um, an individual's uh, motivational patterns influence the way they perceive the world. I've been talking about how um, a motivational profile influences the lens that a person sees the world through. And this includes the meaning that they assign to the words and the actions of others. Based upon someone's motivational profile, they um, they have certain expectations about how things are supposed to unfold or supposed to go. They very often have certain reactions based upon um, what's going on in the environment. And that means that they have um, they have sensitivities. They have sensitivities based upon the, uh, you know, again, what they expect um, based upon their motivational, motivational profile, excuse me. The awareness of what these patterns are can help identify potential sources of friction. Um, I was just mentioning the individual that I was coaching um, uh, six months ago, and this is something that we worked on a ton. Um, we use interpersonal sensitivities. We also use them um, in relation to what was really triggering for him. Um, and those were all based upon his interpersonal sensitivities. So let's uh, get into a little bit of an example here. Ron, 37, is senior manager. He's had a successful career, uh, but he's recently moved into a new role. Um, he's requested a, a coach for this transition because he feels a little bit unprepared, um, happy about the new role, but a little bit unprepared and has received feedback in the past that he could display a little bit more confidence uh, in his approach. Um, and at times he's a little deliberate. Okay. So 
Ron takes the IDI and uh, we start talking to him about um, his interpersonal sensitivities. So first things first, he has a high receiving score, which is this motivation to be in positions where he um, where he is supported. Um, he feels like there's a high degree, degree of collaboration where he can depend on others. What's the sensitivity with a high receiving score? Um, the sensitivity is um, sensitive to feeling um, unsupported, right? Um, very simply, if you were to put two people in the same exact situation, one of them is high receiving, the other one is low, the one who is high receiving will say, oh gosh, I feel very much on an island here. There's no support. And the other individual will say, what are you talking about? I feel great. In fact, it might, there might actually be too much support. Um, so again, it colors the interpretation of, um, of the environment, of the situation. Ron also scored high in gaining stature. Gaining stature is this motivation um, to pay attention to the external world, right? Um, motivation to be uh, to be validated in many ways, to be respected or recognized. People who score high in this dimension very often orient themselves toward what they think the external world is asking of them. Um, and so what's the sensitivity here? Well, sensitive to feeling unappreciated or underrecognized. Again, these individuals are working so hard to ensure that they're showing up in a particular way um, that, uh, and when I say a particular way that, you know, what I'm doing is, is appreciated, um, what I'm, you know, you're respecting me or you're recognizing what I'm bringing to the table. And if they get um, some, some feedback or start to understand that it's not going that way, they can be really sensitive um, to, to both of these things. Ron also scored high in structuring, which is about um, uh, planning, detail, process, organization. People who score high in structuring, they care about the how, right? Um, we're going to cross our T's with the red pen. We're going to dot our I's with the red uh, with <laughs> with the blue one, and and that's just the way that we're going to be doing it because it's the right way. Uh, so uh, the sensitivity here is sensitive to feeling unorganized or messy. If things are being done potentially in ways where the individual um, feels like this isn't how we're supposed to be doing this or we need things in place before we move forward, um, the sensitivity is uh, things are just a little bit chaotic. Okay, let's keep going. So common reaction. Uh, with again, high receiving, um, feeling unsupported. So because Ron is searching for it, he's likely to feel it doesn't exist, right? I'm looking for the support. I'm looking for the collaboration. You ever, you ever go out and um, you're looking for a new car and you start to maybe fall in love with one and then all of a sudden you see it everywhere. Well, it's the same thing here. Right. I'm looking for support. Um, uh, and if uh, and so therefore likely to feel like it doesn't exist. How much you help um, uh, Ron here? Well, let's, let's challenge the internal narrative. What's the truth here? What's actually happening? Are you really not supported? Are you overdoing that um, that storyline in some way? Um, and having conversations, continual conversations about um, you know what what's actually going on in actuality versus person on your shoulder saying, "I don't know that you're supported." Common reaction, again, with high gaining stature, takes feedback or criticism personally, right? Again, these individuals work so hard to ensure that, um, that they're being appreciated or, or coming off um, in a particular way. If they get feed uh, feedback or criticism that it's not going that way, they, it hurts quite a bit and they're very sensitive to it. What's challenging the narrative here? All right, let's recognize the value of what the feedback is, right? Are they, is the individual actually saying that they they don't respect you or, um, you know, they're, they're sort of pulling recognition away from you? Is that really what's happening here? Or is there something else going on? Can we think about this a little bit more objectively? Um, and again, challenge that, challenge that um, the narrative of, um, of the, the, that, that the feedback was even criticism in the first place. Common reaction, high structuring is you know just being very being very cautious about moving forward without a plan or a process, right? And whoa, 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 let's slow down. Let's slow down. I don't, I don't, you know, we don't have everything in place yet. Let's challenge the narrative there a little bit. Let's not undermine progress in favor of perfection, right? People who score high instruction very often want everything in place um, before they move forward, where they can get very deliberate, right? So again, Ron's feedback here that he gets a little too deliberate at times. Maybe that's because he needs things to be sort of too perfect before we make a decision or move forward. How can we channel, uh, excuse me, challenge that internal narrative in some way? So Ron um, expressed some anxiety about the level of support he's receiving from his new peers in a management role. After reviewing the IDI results we explored in the recent meeting um, that, that he found particularly frustrating. So what are some coaching questions? Again, I think in challenging the internal narrative is just an important general one. It goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of today. Um, 
uh, in terms of really understanding your coachee and understanding their narrative and how you can challenge it. But um, how does the awareness reshape your thoughts about recent past events? I always think about understanding um, motivation in terms of a past, present, and future, and thinking about be understanding your own profile and reflecting about what just happened in light of the own profile can be really, really helpful. Um, and this is one way. Can you reframe other behaviors toward you? Can you take your own bias out of the equation? Now that you know that you think this way or that you're looking for this, can you um, reorient in some way um, and, and potentially reframe other behavior toward you? Um, people very often think that that somebody is doing something to them, right? Why, why do they keep doing this to me? It's like, no, that's not what's happening. They're not doing anything to you. Um, you are seeing it through a particular lens. Can we have a, have a more objective conversation about that? Where do you feel you might be lying to yourself? Same, same um, concept here. And how might you use this awareness moving forward? What do you need to hold in your consciousness for tomorrow's meeting? Right? You know that you very often have this reaction with this individual or at, for this project, what do you need to hold in your consciousness to be more effective tomorrow? And knowing a person's IDI profile can be so valuable in that space. Um, I've received so much positive feedback in, 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 that, um, in that space where people feel more successful because they were, because they felt more intentional, because they felt more intentional in how they interacted with others. Okay, I know I'm moving a million miles a minute here, but um, uh, let's just talk about this case study with an executive team using the theme of informational needs. All right, we've got a, a nonprofit executive team. They work well together, looking to improve uh, working relationships. Sometimes they miscommunicate, come a little bit too siloed. Um, they interpret situations a little bit differently. And they're most concerned about how their similar ways of thinking um, uh, may get them and the organization in trouble. What do they need to be more cognizant of? So focus on the theme of um, informational needs. Um, so what am I talking about here? Well, they, uh, informational needs, this theme is how do energy patterns influence what people need to feel informed, right? I need to know this or I need to know that to feel sort of comfortable with what's happening. Um, and it really plays a critical role in what and how people communicate. And what I mean by that is um, critical in terms of what they expect or need from others in communication and also how they often, uh, what they prioritize in their own communication. Uh, because we often, uh, just like many things in life, we communicate in light of how we like to be communicated to. Um, and so this theme really talks about this. Okay, informational needs, we've got five dimensions. Receiving again, this is uh, the general update. So people who score high in receiving in terms of informational needs, they just wanna be kept in the loop. I wanna know what's happening. Their threshold for what is an important piece of information is very low. Um, people who score lower in receiving, that threshold gets a lot higher, it gets a lot higher. Interpreting. I want to know the why, right? I need to understand the logic. Um, I need to understand why we're doing this. What's the content? What's the context of the decision or why we're in, um, engaging in this project? Structuring. I need to know the how. I want to understand the process. You know, how are we doing it? Um, and uh, and what's the plan? Stability. Don't surprise me, right? I like, I really need predictability. I want to understand if something's going to be changing. I want to know as far in advance as possible. And then excelling is all about urgency. I need to know how this, I, I, I'm achievement oriented. How does what we're talking about impact me and what I'm trying to achieve, right? And, and there's a lot of urgency there for me in this. So um, yes, please get to the point. All right, so coaching with motivation in mind. Um, I'm just gonna run through these quickly. So these are some great um, coaching questions, right? Do I fully understand what it takes to keep me optimally informed? These coaching, coaching questions for me are the great coaching questions in general, but in terms of the theme, informational needs, very, very helpful. Um, you know, do I understand what I um, prioritize when communicating or what expectations I have? Have I shared it with others? Do I know what the difference is between to, to me and the people I work with? Um, and how do I know exactly what they need? Am I guessing? Do I rely on my own assumptions? And again, going back to what I was saying earlier, one of the reasons I love using motivation in the IDI in teams is because it's not observable. Every time I have a team session, where people use the IDI, you've got one person turning to another person saying, "Really? That's that that matters to you? Yeah, that's that's how you're that's that's what is influences you in terms of moving forward." I've never would have guessed that, because again, it's not observable, right? Which is um, which is really interesting. Okay, so 
informational needs, how do energy patterns influence what people need to feel and well informed? So here you've got this group of five, you've got two individuals, Fran and Mel, who um, are sharing with each other all day, right? Um, and uh, and so a lot of, uh, I would just call it sort of general camaraderie here in terms of um, just the general update. I just like to know what's going on. Um, doesn't really matter what it is. Anna, Marco, and Navid, less so, right? Especially Navid, who's at sort of that 10 or 15 percentile where um, many of the things that Fran and Mel might be talking about, Navid probably could care less. Context and rationale. Why are we doing what we're doing? We don't have a group here that's overly um, uh, overly sort of sensitive or really needs to know the why. Naveed would be the highest here. Um, but most of the group here is in the mid-range in terms of, yeah, I sort of feel motivated to uh, understand why we're doing what we're doing. But what's much more important is the, is the how. How are we doing it? I don't care why we're making the decision, but great, fine. That's the decision. How are we going to execute that? How's it going to get done? Right. So uh, you got four individuals here um, who is who are really motivated to understand what the process is going to look like. What's the plan? How are we executing? Mel, on the other hand, she's not she's not really motivated by either. Right. Um, and so she's not going to get uptight about either of these things. Much more easygoing, actually, in these two um, in these two dimensions. Advanced information. Right. So you've got a couple of individuals in Marco and Navid who um, need a little bit more consistency. They need a little bit more predictability. Informing Marco and Navid as early as possible about a potential change or we're going to go left instead of right will really meet them where they're at. Right. Uh, Anna and Fran to a little bit less of an extent and Mel, uh, you know, even less. Again, continuing Mel's sort of easygoingness in terms of um, what she needs to, to feel informed. Um, and so again, uh, if, if something is changing, who 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 do we need to almost tell first? Uh, because it's something that will cause a lot of friction for them. Uh, if if you don't, you know, if you walk into a uh, into a meeting one day and Marco wasn't supposed to lead it, and then you tell him right before saying, "Ah, oh, I need you to lead this meeting," he's going to be a little agitated. Mel will be agitated a lot less. And then finally, urgency. Right? How does what we're talking about um, directly influence me? Fran is um, uh, uh, on the upside here, also with Anna, where I need to understand how this impacts what it is I'm working on. And then again, we have Mel here on the uh, on the lower side, who um, you know again a little less a little less concerned. This is actually a group I've worked with, and it really is funny that plays out exactly the way you'd think it play out. Where Mel is an individual who is. Um, extremely easygoing. Um, yes, likes to be in the loop, is a great teammate, but in terms of um, uh, you know, needing a lot of information about why things are happening or how she's being communicated to um, is just, she doesn't have a, a huge motivation to, um, to really need a lot from others, um, yeah, but others in this group do. Okay, so uh, I know I moved quickly there. I hope I give you a little bit of an, some insight into how I use motivation in uh, the in, in, excuse me uh, personal coaching space and then also in the, um, uh, in the team space and I think understanding here motivation is really gets below the surface to give us that why, which um, I hope I've articulated to you, but why I think it's so important. Uh, and I really do believe that it makes you uh, a more intelligent and a, and a better coach. So uh, questions, we wrap up here today, Lucy. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to make a note. Please ignore the activity code on the bottom there. That's not correct for today. Please look in your chat for that. I apologize for that little administrative error on my part. Um, I will drop the correct code in the chat now. Um, a lot of terrific questions and do keep dropping them in. I will mention again, if you want to if you're curious about your own IDI score, or you want to know how it works, um, we invite you to, to give that assessment a try. So just drop IDI in the Q&A box and we'll make sure we follow up with the next steps. Questions. Anyway, we have a lot of great ones. Um, have you found that motivation can cause conflict specifically when they're high? Is our high motivation source of is a source of conflict? Uh, so two different ways. So internally, yes. So if a person has too high, uh, too high motivations uh, for themselves, again, it can cause sort of internal conflict for the person because they're pushed and pulled. Um, if you're talking about together, um, uh, yes, it can. So I'll just talk 
here, give a quick example. Um, there's a motivation. Uh, one of the motivations on the ad is called um, control, controlling. Really talks about this motivation to influence outcomes, have a degree of authority, have a degree of power. If you put two people in a position who are high, who um, who are both high controlling, they op often can butt heads because they are they're both trying to influence the outcome. I wanted to go this way. I wanted to go that way. Uh, and so uh, very often those two uh, those two individuals might. Um, cause conflict uh, with one another. Um, I was working with an organization four or so months ago where that was clearly clearly the issue with the executive team. You had two very high people with high controlling scores that um, they were fighting fighting about what the outcome was going to look like. So yes, is this is the short answer there? Uh, to what degree is it appropriate to help someone try to like reflect on or change their motivation? Oh, um, how question. do you? How would you? talk to somebody about so that. um you fundamentally so what i always tell people when i'm working with them on their motivation and one of the reasons i love it so much is that we're not here to change it you know you can't wake up tomorrow and say you know what i'm going to be more motivated by this today it doesn't really even make sense coming out of my mouth um what so what's really important with motivation is um, understanding what it means for you right what how do how am i set up and what does this mean for my day in and my day out um and i think it's almost a relief for people to have a coaching conversation we are where we are not talking distinctly about how do i change this um, it's it's almost it creates some freedom. No, this is just about understanding. This is just about awareness. Um, and yes, we're going to use it in and I think the developmental space and what it is we need to be thinking about. But we're not taking an active role in trying to bring up that excelling score. I think is a is a, is, a, is a good example. Um, another question because you did show that team case study. Um, sure. After Ooh. getting permission to share the results across the team, how do you present the results and coach the team? I wanted to make sure that we mentioned that there is an option for that. Yes. So um, there's a variety of options. Uh, and so uh, um, we could have a whole other webinar on how, how to do that. So uh, <laughs> I think we do, actually. I can send out a link to it, but <laughs> yeah. I think we actually have a so, webinar on IDI team development. I'll say two things here quickly. First of all, there is an IDI team report that we do have at MRG that's very helpful in the uh, facilitation of team-related IDI results. And secondly, thing, the second thing here is um, if if you ended up getting certified in the IDI and you were going to do a team, uh, a, a team, a session, uh, you would have access to us, right? And access to me potentially where I would be, you know, we would be able to talk you through what, what works, what doesn't work. How should you set this up? Um, what are great coaching questions? Uh, what should you put in the slide deck versus not? Uh, and, and we can talk through uh, unique situations, you know, what's the organization like and come to a decision about what will work best in a specific situation, um, because I think they're all unique in some ways. Great. In the interest of time and letting everybody get to the next hour of their day, I'm going to go ahead and let everyone go. So we're just going to flip ahead um, just a couple more slides on yeah. housekeeping stuff. And there's plenty of information in your chat as well. Um, we do have another free webinar coming up in January. I just dropped the link um, into that chat. So if you want to go ahead and register for that, that's going to be on compassionate leadership. Um, certifications are the path to using the IDI and our other assessments if you're um, interested in those. So um, our next IDI certification is coming right up on December 5th, but we have these throughout the year as well. So we've got our 24. 24 dates are already on the calendar, um, and LEA 360 is our leadership. Uh, personal Directions is like an expansion of the IDI where it gets deeper into the personal. Anyway, all of those are coming up. You can find them on our calendar on mrg.com. Um, and, you know, any anything else you need from us, please just get in touch. Drop it in the Q&A. We'll be doing follow-ups. Um, and I think that's all we have for everyone today. Thank you so much, Drew. Um, this has been really fun and terrific questions. We will get to all of them. Um, so yeah, we'll absolutely be following up with you on all of those. So if you have any last minute thoughts, go ahead and drop them in. Um, we will not leave you hanging. <laughs> all right. Thanks everyone. Thank Thanks so much. Thank you everyone. Take care.